Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Wednesday, September 29th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, what will happen to the bodies of people who die on Mars? Plus, AI has indicated that a famous painting at the National Gallery in London might be a phony. And festival goers at Glastonbury are endangering rare eels with their drug addled refusal to use the public toilets. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Here's a question that seems theoretical to us, but which some scientists in labs around the world are already tasked with figuring out. What will we do with the bodies of people who die on Mars? As Atlas Obscura put it in a 2016 article exploring this idea, quote, It's entirely possible that someone alive today on Earth will be the first person to die on Mars. End quote. Eerie, but true, because getting humans to Mars is becoming more and more of a reality, and even if the mission is successful, many of the plans are for it to be a one-way flight. So eventually, someone will die on Mars, and then... What? In many science fiction portrayals, cosmic wanderers tend to take the same approach of stereotypical pirates when someone dies, toss them overboard. But with space pollution rapidly becoming a serious issue, this probably will not become protocol. Imagine the scene in Avengers Infinity War when the Guardians of the Galaxy fly through the debris and dead bodies of Asgardians. No thanks. But given payload restrictions and the millions upon millions of dollars it takes to get to and from the Red Planet, the likelihood of a body being shipped back to Earth seems slim. And with space so limited, both on spacecrafts going to and fro, as well as eventually on Mars, where every national space agency and many private companies around the world are hoping to one day visit or stay, you might think the space-efficient method of cremation would be a good option. But cremation is super energy intensive. Quoting a recent piece in Discover Magazine from Allison Klesman, cremation requires keeping a chamber in excess of some 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 538 degrees Celsius for several hours, which in turn requires immense energy input. In an environment where such fuel could be limited, that's a costly solution. End quote. So what could be done? Leaving the bodies on Mars intact, I guess, ideally with some kind of burial and ceremony. But bodies wouldn't decompose on Mars the same way they do on Earth. Here's how it works on Earth, when a body isn't embalmed, anyways. From Klesman's Discover article, referencing the expertise of Melissa Connor, a professor of forensic anthropology at Colorado Mesa University, quote, Early on, the body cools, algor mortis, and the blood begins to pool due to gravity, liver mortis. Rigor mortis, or temporary stiffening of the muscles, sets in. Then cells begin to break down as the body's own enzymes destroy them, a process called autolysis. Then putrefaction occurs, as the bacteria that helps us digest our food keep right on trucking along. It's autolysis and putrefaction that cause things like discoloration and other skin changes as well as bloating. Scavengers, such as insects, birds, or other animals, and later fungi also move in, taking care of the rest of the cleanup. Connor does note that decomposition is a continuum in which these processes may overlap, so this isn't necessarily a strict step-by-step process." End quote. Temperature also plays a key role, both in bringing out the insect scavengers and in enabling each step of that process. See, if it gets too cold, the autolysis process stops, the remains dry up, and basically create mummies. And being that the average temperature on Mars is negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit, you can be sure that's what would happen, whether the body was left out on the surface of the planet or buried beneath it. Since most of the bacteria in our bodies require oxygen to function, the bacteria required for putrefaction would be negligible. Meaning, bodies wouldn't undergo a lot of the appearance-based changes we're accustomed to. They would be incredibly well-preserved. But there's also the radiation to keep in mind. Quoting Atlas Obscura, Working against the preservation of the cold would be ionizing radiation, which destroys organic compounds and bathes Mars at levels unheard of on Earth. One plausible explanation for why we haven't found any traces of life on Mars is that the high levels of radiation there zapped any organic compounds and gases that show no trace of their former life. 
Eventually, radiation would do away with more of the body, but it would take eons, 100 million years, from the first human death on Mars, and it's possible that the person's bones could still be found. End quote. Overall, our bodies just wouldn't decompose on Mars. We have evolved on Earth, and other living organisms have as well, to work in concert with one another. When human bodies decompose on Earth, they benefit the environment around them. So many think that we could hack that on Mars. It might not happen naturally, but what if we could regulate the decomposition process? Quoting again from Discover, It might be best to bury a body not outside in the Martian soil, but instead in a temperature and moisture controlled Earth-like decomposition greenhouse, with organisms such as insects and fungi to eventually turn that body into usable fertilizer or soil. End quote. Now, a lot of people balk at that idea, but, you know, I suppose if people consent to that before dying and all parties on Mars are cool with their greenhouses being fertilized by their late colleagues, it could be all right. One bioengineer working on this concept is J.J. Hastings, a self-described extremophile and commander of the Sensorial One mission, part of the Hawaii-based High Seas program that puts people in a habitat to study how potential tasks for astronauts in space or on Mars might play out. Hastings, alongside fashion design researcher Pia Interlandi, haven't said too much about their human remains composting project yet, and it seems that part of their research may have been derailed by COVID, but in early 2020, the two shared with Space.com the death garments that they've designed that would serve both function and grieving ritual on Mars. Quoting Space.com, The garment has four layers and is 100% biodegradable, so the body can decompose more easily without creating additional synthetic waste. Interlandi's pieces are designed to be easy to put on a stiff corpse, she told Space.com. She further explained that the Martian garment, specifically, consists entirely of different types of silk, different weights and textures. And the project used silk because not only does it look and feel nice, it's lightweight and is made out of protein from silkworms. And that means that when the death ritual reaches the human recycler stage, the garment's proteins could be processed along with those from the human body. Wool would also work for this reason, but silk was a better choice because of its feel, textures, and weight, Interlandi explained. End quote. The garment does look quite nice and was designed really intentionally, you know, purposefully having several layers to create a ritual that can guide grieving. You can see photos at the space.com link in the show notes if you're interested. But back at Discover Magazine, Klesman thinks there is one other possibility for what will happen to our bodies after death on Mars. Maybe our anaerobic bacteria will adapt to the Martian environment and natural decomposition will be possible. Quoting once more, Evolution is ongoing and can happen quickly, Connor says, noting, for example, the rapid appearance of COVID-19 variants throughout the pandemic. And so I would not be surprised if something that we carried from Earth evolved quickly to take advantage of a new food source, particularly if there was a cemetery of colonists, end quote. Even though all of this can so easily feel like a thought experiment or some big project basically just planning Elon Musk's intended funeral on Mars— like so much in space exploration, it matters Earthside too. Sustainable methods for physically storing and handling our dead is only going to become more important, and many of these methods being explored for Mars could help us innovate on Earth and prepare us psychologically for practices that are different from the ones we're accustomed to. A new artificial intelligence study suggests that the famous Samson and Delilah painting by Peter Paul Rubens on display at the National Gallery in London was in fact not painted by Rubens at all. So Peter Paul Rubens, the 17th century Flemish artist, not Paul Rubens, a.k.a. Pee Wee Herman, like many of his peers, was a prolific creator of artistic works, paintings, tapestries, interior decor. His painting, Massacre of the Innocents, sold for 49.5 million pounds in 2002. When the National Gallery bought this Samson and Delilah painting, depicting the moment Delilah betrays Samson in the Old Testament, it broke records as the third most expensive piece of artwork ever purchased at auction at the time. That was back in 1980, and since then, the piece has attracted rumblings from critics who doubt the authenticity of the painting. Quoting The Guardian, 
Critics have long argued that it is only a copy of a Rubens original that is known to have been painted between 1608 and 1609 for his Antwerp patron, Nicolas Rocox, which then disappeared after his death in 1640. They argue that the National Gallery picture is a different painting, one that only surfaced in 1929, declared a Rubens by Ludwig Burchard, an expert who, after his death in 1960, was found to have misattributed paintings by giving out certificates of authenticity for for commercial gain. The picture's critics dismiss its colors as uncharacteristic of Rubens' palette and its composition as awkward. They question why, for example, it differs from two contemporary copies made from Rubens' original. The toes of Samson's outstretched right foot, for example, are cropped in the National Gallery version while they're shown in an engraving by Jacob Matham and a painting that depicts the Samson and Delilah hanging in Rakoch's home by Franz Franken the Younger." End quote. But now, the more objective gaze of AI has struck its gavel and declared the Samson and Delilah hanging in the National Gallery is indeed a fake. A Swiss company called Art Recognition, who has analyzed over 400 pieces of art with their AI, ran the study, and the next web's Neural described how it worked. Quote, The firm's tool is based on a deep convolutional neuronal network. The system learns to identify an artist's characteristics by training the algorithm on images of their real works. The training dataset is then augmented by splitting the images into smaller patches, which are zoomed into to capture the finer details. Once the training is complete, the algorithm is fed a new image to assess. It then analyzes the picture's features to evaluate the likelihood of it being genuine. After comparing Samson and Delilah with 148 genuine Rubens paintings, the system gave the artwork a 91% probability of being inauthentic." End quote. Dr. Karina Popovici, co-founder of Art Recognition and the study's lead, told The Guardian that they repeated the experiment several times to verify the results and, quote, every patch, every single square came out as fake with more than 90% probability, end quote. And to further cover their tracks, the team also analyzed another Rubens work on display in the National Gallery, a view of Hetstein in the early morning, and that one came back with a 98.76% probability of having truly been done by Rubens. So that's good, but the National Gallery does not have a great track record lately. Ten years ago, it included a painting called the Salvatore Mundi in a Leonardo da Vinci exhibit, even though his full or partial contributions to the painting are unknown. They attracted a lot of criticism over that, especially because it helped lead to a highly sensationalized spectacle around its sale at Christie's, where it sold for a record $450 million and spawned multiple documentaries and even a proposal for a Broadway musical based on the painting's history. Especially in light of the Salvatore Mundi debacle, Michael Daly, director of Artwatch UK and one of the earlier critics of the Samson and Delilah painting, says these new findings are exceedingly damning and a calamity for the National Gallery. That there were already critics doubting the authenticity of this painting makes me trust the AI more than I would if some scientists were just sicking AI on any random painting to try to own the museums or something, which does not at all appear to be what art recognition is doing, is just kind of my knee-jerk reaction when I hear something like this. Art Recognition co-founder Popovici told The Guardian, The significance of this new AI method of authentication is potentially groundbreaking. Devoid of human subjectivity, emotion, and commercial interests, the software is coldly objective and scientifically accurate. Many questionable works were attributed to Rubens at the beginning of the 20th century. There is today a distinct need for more reliable methods of connoisseurship. End quote. More reliable... Perhaps scientifically accurate, I'll grant you, but devoid of human subjectivity and commercial interests, I'm not so sure. You know, maybe this study, but I wouldn't make that a blanket statement about all endeavors going forward. You know, even with the scientific method and ethics in place, it's the choice of the scientists which works to study. And there's a bias even in that. You know, an organization with funding from one institution could intentionally select works to analyze that they're pretty sure are authentic already while selecting more dubious ones from a competitor. Until we get closer to the specter of the singularity, algorithms are still made by and deployed by humans. And I think it's important to push back against claims of 100% objectivity, especially in the realm of art.
Glastonbury Festival, a massive outdoor music festival in England, sort of similar to Lollapalooza in the States, likes to say that it's the largest greenfield music and performing arts festival in the world. But now it might have another claim to fame. Being the source of so much public urination that the drugs its festival goers were taking were present in a nearby river. Quoting The Guardian, Researchers measured levels of illegal drugs in the river before, during, and after the last Glastonbury Festival in 2019, comparing levels upstream and downstream of the event. After the 2019 festival, drug levels in River White Lake were high enough to harm aquatic wildlife, including a rare eel population, according to the report. It found that the amount of MDMA was 104 times greater downstream than upstream in the weeks after the festival, rising to levels that could harm the life cycle of European eels, a protected species. Cocaine concentration was 40 times higher downstream, although the levels of cocaine were not considered harmful to aquatic life. Previous research has shown that cocaine traces in rivers can cause eels to become hyperactive and experience muscle wastage, impaired gills, and hormonal changes. End quote. Study League Dan Aberg says this kind of drug contamination from public urination happens at every festival, but Glastonbury's is particularly concerning environmentally, both due to its size and its proximity to a river. Glastonbury Festival, for their part, have been doing what they can to curb public urination over the years. In 2019, they had a whole campaign with some pretty nicely designed posters called Don't Pee on the Land. And they say that they're willing to work with these researchers on recommendations of other tactics they can implement, like perhaps the use of constructed treatment wetlands. And this whole story just reminds me how much event organizers have to deal with. Like, this is a pretty funny and also damning report, but the fact that the festival is just like, yes, we know, we're trying, it just makes me think of everyone I know who works in events and the absolutely wild stories they have to tell about attendees and all kinds of contingency plans they always have to have in place that, like, you would never imagine if you didn't work in that field. People, especially when put into groups together, are just massive agents of chaos. Well, that's it for me for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.